Today, really, we're going to set a foundation for the rest of this series. And then next week, I hope you'll come back, especially if you're interested in end times and all of that kind of stuff, because next week, I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot view of the book of Revelation. If you ever read the book of Revelation, it's kind of like a puzzle wrapped inside an enigma, right? Like it's confusing, like it's complicated. And so I got a big task at hand. Next week, I'm going to try to give you like as simple as possible, a breakdown of what's covered in the book of Revelation. So bring something to take notes with you. It's going to be really interesting, really fascinating. But today I want to give us just like a foundation to really set us up for the rest of the series. So if you got a copy of God's Word, turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Next week, we'll move all around the book of Revelation. I'll give you a lot of scripture, but today we're going to stick and stay in Matthew chapter 24. Maybe you got a Bible app and you can turn there with me on your phone. But Matthew 24, we're going to start in verse 29. Now, I would encourage you to read the whole thing because it's all from Jesus And Jesus is specifically answering the question from his disciples, are we in the last days? And so I don't know about you, but I want to hear firsthand, are we in the last days from Jesus, straight from the source? And so he answers that question, and he gives us really a summary of end time events. And so it's going to be really helpful. We won't have time to read all of it, but we'll read a good chunk of it. But Matthew chapter 24 And I'm going to start in verse 29 and go all the way through verse 46. And I'm going to read out the NLT, the New Living Translation. For those that are taking notes, you could jot this down as well. But but many scholars call this the Olivet Discourse, this section of Scripture. And here's what it says. Straight from Jesus, verse 29. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming. Jesus is talking about himself. He always referred to himself as the Son of Man. Even at, or the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now move down with me a few verses for time's sake here to verse 36, same chapter. Jesus goes on. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. And people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Now next, as we keep reading, Jesus gives some illustrations, some examples of kind of what this is going to look like. Verse 40, two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. And if that homeowner was in Texas, there'd be at least one shotgun right next to him. You know what I'm talking about? Like, y'all need to laugh a little bit. Y'all are way too intense, okay? We're not in New York or California. We like our guns here. Anyways, all right, let's keep going. Verse 44, you also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for what you've already done today in this service. God, we celebrate the miracle and how you came through and you do come through time and time again. And we're so excited to see all the different renovations take place in our next gen ministries and areas, God. And so we give you glory 
in honor. And, and God, we also thank you in this service, how we dedicated these children and these families to you. What a special moment that is. And God, we also believe that here in this message, God, you're going to use it to encourage us and inspire us and even in some ways challenge us to make sure that we have the right heart in mind when it comes to you and you coming again, Lord. And so I pray for those that know a lot about the Bible and those that know very little, that all of us, God, in the room and online, that we would, we would grow together and we would lean in to hear what you have to say. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Now, one important disclaimer before I give you a couple of things from this passage. One thing I gotta get it right out there from the very beginning of this series, it's really important that you get this, okay? Here, here's the one thing. Anytime you're in an environment where a pastor talks about the end times or even at coffee with a friend and you're talking about end times, anytime you're around somebody that's talking about the end of the world, if they ever act like they are 100% sure, if they ever act like they figured it all out and they've connected all the dots and man, they got the Da Vinci code and they know numerology and they figured out and they got this big map. Anytime that that would happen in your life, run for the exits. Like y'all hearing me? Anytime you're around somebody that says, you know what? An angel told me. Oh, you know what? I got revelation from Jesus, I know exactly how it's gonna happen. You need to do, any time that would happen, you don't walk to the exit. You run for your life to the exit because the Bible is very clear. Jesus is very clear. The angels don't know the time. Even Jesus himself, God the Father knows. Y'all with me this morning? And so we just gotta have like the right perspective. And so all the stuff that I'm gonna share with you today and even more detail next week, I'm gonna use this word a lot, it seems like. Not I know for sure, but it seems like this is what it's saying. And so we gotta be real careful that we don't act like we got it all figured out because no one has it all figured out. Like I said earlier, especially the book of Revelation, it is confused. I went to Bible college. I made good grades in my Bible college classes, but it is still confusing and we, we don't really know. And so I just gotta get that disclaimer out there, all right? Make sure that we're all on the same page together. But in Matthew 24, what's really interesting about this passage is as you study context clues and the text very closely, and as you read different scholarly accounts, it seems like, there's that word, it seems like the time that Jesus is describing in this chapter is the end of the seven years of tribulation. It seems like that. We don't know for sure, but it seems like it. Now, there's different viewpoints when it comes to this, and I'll talk more about it next week. This is just a foundation. But there's different viewpoints in the church of, of the tribulation. And if you don't know what the tribulation is, it's seven years. Some people call it the great tribulation, but horrible things happening and, and just all these different things. Like there's, we'll, we'll talk about it next week. There's a lot going on. But there's people in the church, some of us, and in fact, I'm in this group, that we think that, that the rapture would happen before the tribulation. And again, I don't know that. I think that. I hope that, to be honest with you, because I don't want to be here for the tribulation, and you don't either, no matter what you believe. But, but I hope that, that, that we get raptured up before the seven years, and so we would be raptured, seven years of tribulation, and then the second coming. There's others of you probably in this room that you're like, nope, past year, you're wrong, and you're about to send me like a long email with all these references. Save your time on your keyboard, okay? Like, don't send that to me. I, I, I could be wrong. There's other people that you think, hey, it's the middle of the tribulation. They're called mid-trib people, mid-tribulation. So you think three and a half years, kind of in the middle. And there's another group of you that you are called post-trib people, post-tribulation, and you think that the rapture and the second coming are all one and the same, and that it's all gonna happen at the end. Now, we don't know for sure. Again, if anybody tells you they know for sure, run away. We don't know for sure. But here's what we do know for sure. And I hope I get a good amen in the church on this one. Here's what we do know. Jesus is coming again. Come on, can I get a better amen? He's coming again. It's, 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 not, a, it's not an if, it's, it's, it's a when. And Jesus says, hey, hey, no one knows the hour. And so 
if we believe that Jesus is coming again, and I think there's a lot of us, then what do we do about that knowledge? You know, like what do we do with that information? And that's why Jesus gives us Matthew 24. His goal is not to give us a timeline. He's just summing up some things. His goal is to give us the tools needed before he comes back again to do what we can now to live the way we're supposed to live. He's trying to help us in the meantime as he tarries before he comes back. In fact, you can write this word down, real theological word, very important term. But Jesus' second coming, his return is imminent. It's imminent. We don't know the hour, we don't know when, we just know it's gonna happen. And honestly, it could happen before I even finish this sermon. Some of you are like, yes, please, happen so we can go. But like, it's just the reality. His return is imminent. And so with that information, Jesus gives us some tools here in Matthew 24 to help us live the way we should. In fact, it has got two things from you from this passage. I hope you'll write them down. I think they'll be very helpful for you. But here's the first thing Jesus tells us here in Matthew 24. He says, because I'm coming again, you need to, number one, be ready. You got to be ready. Like, I love you too much to not give you God's word and to share the truth with you that you need to be ready. It's really interesting because not just from Jesus in Matthew 24, but if you add up all the different times from Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, all the way to the last book, Revelation, if you add up all the times that Jesus or Peter or Paul talk about the second coming, it's over 300 times. Over 300. And so Jesus wants you ready. He wants you ready. He's trying to get your attention. He's trying to get my attention. It, it's not an opinion. It's a fact. He is coming again. His return is imminent. And this is where Jesus spends most of chapter 24, trying to get you ready, trying to get me ready. He wants us ready for his return. And he knows that being ready is a challenge because we're all so busy. Like I've never had an adult come up to me before and say, you know, Pastor Ryan, I'm just, I'm not busy. You know, I wish I was more busy. Can you give me some stuff to do? I don't really, kids say that, right? Your teenagers say that the first week into summer break, right? But adults never heard one person say, you know what? I'm not busy at all. We are all so busy. Most of us have something planned almost every single night of the week, especially if you have kids and all the different activities and all the different sports, right? Like like we are so busy and Jesus knew this. He knew we could easily get sidetracked. And so he's letting us know, hey, Listen up, you need to be ready. Don't get sidetracked, focus on the main thing. Now let's talk about what Jesus means by be ready for a moment because here's what he doesn't mean and I hope you'll hear me on this. Like there's a little bit of comedy mixed in what you're about to hear but it's also true. Here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that you need to be ready by buying a doomsday bunker, Okay. There, there, there's some crazy Christians out there, crazy Christians that have enough money to have their own TV show. I'm not saying any names, but it's all about, hey, you buy this bucket or you buy this thing and we'll make sure you make it through everything that's happening. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he says, be ready. He's not saying, hey, make sure you learn how to churn your own butter and make sure you know like you've got canned goods to stock up for years. He's not saying, hey, go get a cabin in the woods and completely disconnect like Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec and make sure you're off the grid like one of you got that reference that's okay but like like don't like he's no no Jesus is not saying that he's not saying hey make sure you get some compound somewhere and you all knit each other's clothes and make sure you sing kumbaya like no that's weird that's crazy that's not what he's talking about well what's he talking about pastor that you got to make sure your heart is ready that you got to make sure your mind is ready because there's going to be all this stuff that's pulling for your attention, all of this stuff. What, what's he say? That there's gonna be people that they're planning a party more than they're making sure their, their heart is ready for Jesus coming again. 
What, what is he saying? There's going to be people that are putting so much planning into their wedding, which if you've been married, you know there was way too much planning and way too much money put into a 20-minute ceremony. Can I get an amen from some guys in the room? Like, it is like, like it, it's a lot of planning for 20 minutes. And some of us, and, and I know it's a little in your face, but I just got to tell you the truth. Some of us will spend more time and effort on that than making sure our heart is ready before God. So Jesus is like not trying to make you feel bad or me feel bad. He's just making sure we keep the main thing the main thing. He's making sure that we no longer have the excuse, well, I wish somebody would have told me. Well, I'm telling you right now, be ready. And so let's just make this personal. Don't answer out loud, it's rhetorical, but I hope you'll have the boldness in God's house to answer in your heart and mind. Are you ready personally for the second coming of Jesus? Like, are you ready? I'm not talking about church attendance or how long you've served on a team here. I'm talking about you spiritually. Because how many of y'all know it can look good on the outside, but it could be corrupt on the inside. And we can say all the right things and do all the right things like externally, but there's no heart in it. There's no connection. There's no right relationship with Jesus. We're kind of playing religious games, but maybe we're far from God from within. And so you just got to ask yourself personally, am I ready for Jesus coming again? Now, I want to be real honest with you, and I'm going to do that the whole series and this whole message today. But when Jesus comes again, you're not going to wish you spent more time at the office. Oh, I really wish, I, you know, I finished that, that, that project. You know, I really, I really, really wish I put in some more hours the other day. No, no, no. When Jesus comes again, you're not going to wish you had put your kids in more weekly activities. Oh, well, they had soccer and band, but I really, really wish we had baseball in there too. Not going to happen. Like, like you're not going to wish you had, had more stuff. Oh, I wish we went with the bigger house. Oh, I wish we got that dream car. None of that is gonna happen. When Jesus comes again, everything that's caused pride within us, all of our earthly accomplishments, all that we've built, the success at work or our expensive degrees, none of it is gonna last forever. None of it. And I'm not saying like you shouldn't have that stuff. And Jesus isn't saying that either. Here's what he's saying. Don't let the other thing become the main thing what's the main thing Jesus at the center of it all am I in the right place just want to make sure is this Christ covenant like help me out Christians like we got to be ready we got to be ready not saying that other stuff's bad but it's not the main thing Jesus says don't get caught off guard don't act like you've got all the time in the world to get your relationship right with Jesus get ready now for his return his return is imminent so here's some practical wisdom for you and my, my your family my family in view of the last days and then we'll move on to the second point and there's not a slide for this but it'd be good to jot this down I think it's a healthy mindset practical wisdom how, how do we how do we get ready how, how do we have the right mindset here it is we should plan like Jesus isn't coming back for a hundred years but live like Jesus is coming back today come on can I say can I say that again I, I gotta make sure that gets in you plan like Jesus isn't coming back for a hundred years but live like Jesus is coming back today and so if you got kids have a savings account Pay, pay down debt so you don't give them that kind of legacy, right? You don't, want to hand him, you don't want to hand him or her or your kids all that stuff. Like, do things to think long. Play the long game. Make sure that you've got stuff set up and make sure that you're living beneath your means. Make sure that you're doing things to connect the dots for them and the next generation. But at the same time, live with a holy expectation that all that planning's good, but at any moment... Jesus is coming back again. That's health. That's what Jesus wants for you and me. That we would plan like it's gonna be 100 years, but we would live in such a way that we realize that he could come back at any time. You, you, you with me, church? Let, let's keep going here. Number two, second reason why Jesus spends a whole chapter on the end times answering the disciples' question. The second response to Jesus coming back again is this. Number two, it's the last one I got that we should be responsible. B 
be responsible. And so we should be ready personally. I'm not talking about your spouse or whoever drug you to church today, right? Like I'm not talking about your best friend or your kid. I'm talking about you. Are you ready? And the second point, and really this is tailor-made for Christians, followers of Jesus, that we should be responsible. Like even think about this logically for a moment, because maybe you're not convinced he's coming back again. I believe that with all my heart. Jesus believed that. The scriptures say that. But maybe you're not convinced. Well, well, just think about it logically for a moment. If there's a chance that Jesus is coming back again, if there's even a remote chance, shouldn't that cause us to live a little differently? Right? Like, like say it's 1% for you. Say it's 10%. Maybe, maybe it's 50%. It should cause us to live differently. I, I'll prove it to you. God forbid any of us find out we got 60 days to live because of a disease or cancer or different stage that, that it's in. God forbid that happens 60 days, 30 days. Do you think you're gonna live differently with those last 60 days? Do you think you're gonna live differently with those last 30 days? Absolutely. Again, you're not gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna make sure that I, I get all my work done these next 60 days. No. What are you gonna do? You're gonna surround yourself with people you care about. You're not gonna isolate. You're gonna be around your family, your close friends. And those that follow Jesus, you're not just gonna be around your close friends and your family. There's gonna be a fire in your bones to tell them about the hope that you have in Jesus. You're like, hey, my, my time's limited, so I'm gonna use every conversation. I'm gonna use every email. I, I'm gonna use every meal with someone and I'm gonna tell them about Jesus because my time is short. That's how you're gonna live your life. And so knowing and believing that Jesus is coming back again, even if you're not all the way sure, it should cause you to live differently, to live on purpose, to live on mission. And that's what Jesus spends the last half of Matthew 24 talking about, right? He talks about faithfulness. He talks about mission. He talks about calling. He even talks about like hospitality. Like, make sure you're taking care of those in the household. Jesus is saying to us who follow him that we have a responsibility to show his love to other people. Can I, can I tell you, the responsibility is not on the government. It's not on the professional pastors that have microphones in their hands. In fact, can I, I did this in verse service too. Can I do this right now? Like, y'all just need to know you're, you're a pastor. Wait, 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 wait. I, I just got to say, you, you, you're a pastor. The Bible says that you're a royal priesthood. And so, so let's just get rid of the excuse right now. This is gonna be fun. I'm gonna ordain you in five seconds, okay? In Jesus' name, you're ordained. Done. You're a pastor. Done. You're, it's, it's done. You're a pastor. Like, put that on your Twitter profile. You are. You're, you're a pastor. Like, text your best friend. Hey, guess what? You better start calling me Pastor Ryan now or Pastor Sarah now. Like, yeah, you're a pastor. You are, that's what God says. And so you've got a responsibility, not just on a Sunday morning, but most importantly, Monday through Saturday to share your faith, to share your faith. And the sad reality, I'm not trying to make anybody feel mad, like mad or sad or offended or whatever. I just gotta tell you the truth. A sad reality for a lot of Christians is there's far too many Christians that have never led one person to Jesus in their lifetime. The numbers are staggering. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to encourage you that you have a responsibility. And if you believe like I do that Jesus is coming again and it's imminent, it could happen any time, then there should be a passion on the inside of you. Hey, I, I gotta share my faith. Now, people share their faith differently and, and maybe you don't like the methods that I'm about to tell you, but I know there's definitely not, not some methods that I like and I'm, I'm never about like standing on like, you know, a corner and like having a sign like turn or burn, you know, that kind of deal. Like shouting at people, like that, that, that's not, I don't know how great that works. Here, here's how I do it. I share my faith, and I'm not talking about on a platform. 
I'm talking about through my life. Like, y'all just need to know, I don't even tell people a lot of times I'm a pastor because I can shut a party down way faster than you could start a party, okay? Like a lot of times, hey, what do you do for, uh, I'm in sales. Uh, what do you sell? Jesus? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, like seriously, I, I don't know. I'm not scared to be a Christian. Like, I'll tell people that, but I'm just talking about my profession. People just get real nervous and real holy. The other day I was around a guy and he was just dropping bombs after bombs with like his words. And all of a sudden he found out I was a pastor. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, dude, just be you, you know, not approving what he's saying, but, but I'm just trying to love people and lead them to Jesus, you know, like don't pretend you're somebody. No change is going to happen if they put on a face. Anyways, and so here's how I do it. I'd share my testimony. That, that's how I lead people to Jesus outside of a microphone moment and a service. I share my testimony. Here's what I say. I say, you know what? I was messed up. Like I had some issues. I went to ungodly relationships. I went to substances, trying to get a quick fix and feel better about my brokenness, but I was messed up. But then I heard about Jesus, that he is real and he is God and that he loved me and he has saved me and he set me free. And if he did it for me, he could do it for you. I, I, think, I think that's a better way to share your faith and to, point someone to Jesus. I'm not talking about watered down anything. I'm talking about being salt and light. I'm talking about sharing with others the hope that you have. And that's when people listen. That's when people are open. That you talk about your life before Jesus and what he's done in your life and how it's changed your life. People want some of that. So church, we got a responsibility not to guilt people or manipulate people, but to share our faith. Let's just, let's just, let's just say it like it is. You and I, we, we, we all have people in our families that are far from God. Can we just be honest about that? We all have people in our neighborhoods in your apartment complex that are far from God. And when Jesus comes back again, it's, it's very clear here in this text, but all throughout the Bible, when Jesus comes back again, he's looking for a pure church, a pure people, people who have, have surrendered their life to him. That's just the reality. And so because we have the cure, I'm talking to Christians still, because we have the cure to all the brokenness and the sin, why would we not share it with those that are hurting? Like, are you with me on this? Like we have a responsibility. I know this is heavy. You're like, pastor, you have, you've made some crazy pivots today. It was like offering celebration, child dedication, and now the end of the world. Like, I'm just trying to keep up. I get it. I know it's heavy, but I love you too much to not tell you the truth. Jesus believed and he said he's coming again. I want you ready and followers of Jesus. I want you to know we have a responsibility share our faith, not just on a Sunday. Like bring them to a Sunday, that's great. Bring them to your small group, that's great. But all throughout your life, in all the different areas, and all the different seasons, that you would share, hey, this is what Jesus has done in my life, and he can do it in your life too. Last little thought, and then we'll pray. Some of you are wondering, like, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? I've thought that before. Like, have you ever thought that before? Like, because obviously Jesus is talking 2,000 years ago. Hey, you know, the end is near. If you read all the New Testament, they were convinced that it was going to happen in their lifetime too. So maybe you're wondering, like, why is he not come back yet? I, I actually have that answer. It's because of his grace and mercy. That's why he hasn't come back yet. Like, don't get me wrong. Th there's a day coming where God the Father will look at his son and say, it's time, it's time. There's a day coming. And again, it could be today. But Jesus, the Lord in his grace and his mercy, he has held back. Like, aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't give up on you? That he was patient with you? 
that He waited on you. There will be a day where the wrath of God overcomes the grace and mercy of God. Don't get it twisted. That day's coming. God is righteous and He will rightfully judge us. It's just the truth. But He has waited. He has tarried. Right now, His grace and His mercy is overwhelming His wrath. And He has held back and He has held back. But one day He is coming. And when He comes, there's no more time. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to prepare you. Time is now to be ready. Christians, the time is now to be responsible with the hope that we have in Jesus. He's the answer. And when Jesus comes again, those that are following him, it's a celebration. Why? Because all the junk in this world can't follow us up to heaven. Y'all know there's no people COVID positive in heaven, right? Y'all know that. No disease, no cancer, no debt. Thank you, Jesus. Right, it can't, it can't chase you down. So those that are following Jesus that are ready, it's our blessed hope. We're not filled with fear, we're filled with faith. Can I give you a spoiler alert? We win in the end. We're on God's team. Like, aren't you thankful for that? We win in the end. And so we say, come Jesus. But if you gotta wait for more people to follow you, then you wait. We're ready and we're responsible. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray for your people right now in the second service. I know it's a heavy topic, but it's obviously an important topic. Jesus, you said yourself that the end is near. You are coming again. And it could happen at any moment. It's not if, it's when. And I pray, first of all, that your people, we would be ready. Before we get into all the different details next week and, and we learn together and, and we find out all the different things in Revelation, God, before we get to all of that, we got to start here. This is the foundation. Are we ready personally? Have we given our life to Jesus? It's not about a religion, friend. It's about a relationship with Jesus. And if you're not ready, you can make that change right now. In fact, just like first service, I want to invite you in this service. You've got a chance. Now is the time. Not trying to scare you, just want you prepared. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. And so if you want to give your life to Jesus in this room and online, you can do that right now. You can whisper to him. You can whisper to him things like this. Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you're coming again. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to clean me up from the inside. I want my relationship with you right. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I thank you that right now you're readying my heart and my mind. I'm gonna focus on the main thing, you, Jesus. All that other stuff's fine, but it doesn't get first place in my life anymore. You get first place. Thank you, Jesus, for those that are saying that prayer for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time. We wanna be ready. In your grace and your mercy, you have tarried, you have waited, you are patient with us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And I pray, God, for those that are already following Jesus like myself, I pray, God, you'd help us to understand we have a responsibility. This is the one of the reasons why you give us a whole chapter on the end times because you wanted your people not only to be ready personally, but your followers to know that they are responsible. We are responsible. It's no one else's job but the church. That we would share our faith, not in a weird way or a preachy kind of way, but that we would just share our testimony. Hey, this is what Jesus has done in my life and he can do it in your life. I pray God you would mobilize Christ's covenant church to be your hands and be your feet. I love all the serving that happens on a Sunday morning, but we know, God, that's not everything. Monday through Saturday at our school, at our job, in our neighborhood, in our communities, in our city, we are called to be salt and light, to take care of people, to love those that are hurting and broken, to be friendly, 
to point people to you. God, we take up that mantle as pastors, ministers of the gospel, the good news. God, thank you for what you've done in our services. We love you so much, and we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCub.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCub.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.